uh, 20th century atrocities committed by the Nazis and Soviets in Europe. In the past few years, he's become a leading voice warning of the growing threat of dictatorial rule to our freedom. His last two popular works on tyranny and the road to unfreedom described how to resist authoritarianism and trace the path of its recent resurgence. His new book is of a, a very different sort. It's a personal account and it stems from his ordeals being hospitalized and treated for some serious medical problems starting late last year based on his own difficult experience as a patient and on a broader assessment of American medical care, Tim offers a scathing critique of our system of commercial medicine as one driven too much by profit and not enough by ensuring proper medical care. He also draws a connection between health and freedom, making a compelling case that poor medical care violates America's founding principles. Anyone who knows Tim's work is aware of how impassioned and persuasive he can be on topics of importance to him. And this new book is no exception. Uh, don't, don't be fooled uh, by its compact size, like On Tyranny, which was similarly slim. Our malady will worry you and move you. Uh, in conversation with Tim, with Tim will be Jonathan Kirsch, who's a publishing attorney and author of more than a dozen works of, of either fiction or nonfiction. His most recent book is a short, strange life of Herschel Grinspan uh, about the Jewish teenager who shot a Nazi diplomat at the German embassy in Paris in 1938, an event that Hitler seized on to unleash Kristallnacht. Uh, so Tim and, and Jonathan, the screen is yours. Thank you. Tim, uh, congratulations on your new book and uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk about it a bit today. Um, you sum up your new book, Our Malady, uh, in a call to action. Our public malady, you write, is a physical illness and the political evil that surrounds it. And you write that both our freedom and our health are at stake. Your words are, if our federal government and our commercial medicine make us unhealthy, they are also making us unfree. Uh, I will be circling back to these fundamental ideas in your book, but uh, first I wanted to pause on the fact that our malady is the most introspective and intimate of all of your books. Uh, the point was made for me when you write that your hospital journals, as you put it, stained by saline, alcohol, and blood, were filled with the powerful emotions that rescued me when I was near death. My question is, for someone who is known and revered as an academic historian and a public intellectual, was it challenging for you to go so deeply into your own experience in print? I, it, 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 you know, I think if I'd ever posed the question to myself that you're posing to me now, I would have reflected upon it and said, ah, this is something different that I'm doing. But the origins of the book come out of a moment which is very different than the moment that you and I are sharing now. Um, the book came, as you say, out of the hospital. It came out of a moment when I was very sick, writing things down, which I did in, in throughout my hospital stays, was a way of reminding myself that there was still enough of me around that I could make sense of things, if only in words and, and snippets and, 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 and phrases. And when I started writing the book, I was writing the book partly to, to reassure myself that I could still do things like that, that I could still put sentences together, that I could still think, that I could, that I could still write. So in other words, the person who wrote this book wasn't, wasn't reflecting the way that you're asking me to reflect. The person who wrote this book wasn't sure that he was gonna be you know, that, 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 that noted historian you're talking yeah. about. The person who wrote this book was, was, I was concerned with existential things like, am I gonna live to the spring? And what am I learning from this? And how can I possibly take this experience and make it legible and useful for, for, for other people? So I wasn't, 
I, I get the question now, but I wasn't like at the time I wasn't thinking about that at all. You know, it and once I'd finished the book, I then it was then I, I trusted my friends with the question of whether this is the kind of thing which the world should also be reading. You know, it it, it, it wasn't necessarily going to be something that was going to be published. Uh, when I compare uh, our malady to On Tyranny, another important book. Uh, I, I regard on tyranny as a manifesto. Uh, you, do you think it's fair to say that our malady is equal parts memoir and manifesto because of the way you have disclosed and described your own personal ordeal? Yeah. Well, first of all, Jonathan, I want to say it's very, it's very nice to talk to you again. You know, usually okay. I have to travel all the way to Los Angeles to talk to you. And so, you know, one of the small blessings of our general curse is that we can have conversations when we're not we're not in the same place. And when Jonathan and I talked about on tyranny, we've been talking about my work now for for a decade, and I'm I'm very glad of that. It, our our malady is more of a memoir than anything that I've written, and I'm sure more of a memoir than anything I ever will write. Um, it can only it can only work because I have this particular memory of how I went through the medical system, but also I have these very sharp and clear memories of how people around me were treated. Um, the friends who tried to help me, how they were treated, the other people in the hospital or the emergency room, how they were treated, the doctors and the nurses, um, the good ones I mean, how they were pushing uphill and against what kind of resistance they were pushing. I mean, oddly, when I was very sick, um, I could still remember everything. I still took everything in. Everything actually was really sharp, really sharp and clear. And in that sense, like it's it's a it's it's a once. I mean, I I hate to use the phrase, you know, but it's a once in a lifetime opportunity because I hope never to have that kind of clarity again. Yeah. I mean, I hope I hope that things are never so stark again for me, at, at least you know in the next little while as they were in those few days. So I was particularly able, I think, to. To, 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 to record details because at, when I was physically immobilized, everything was coming through my senses and just lodging there. And my mind, you know, when I wasn't unconscious, which was a fair amount of the time, um, but when I wasn't unconscious, you know, and when I, and I wasn't recovering from some drug or when, you know, it, 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 in those times, my thinking was weirdly sharp. And so I, I tried to write the things down. And then it becomes a manifesto because, you know, the thinking is about how the little things that happened to me, because of course, like I'm not, you know, I'm not a victim, like much worse things happen to people all the time. The little things that happened to me gave me just little angles of view, you know, little apertures into other kinds of experiences that Americans are having all the time. And that's how the memoir becomes the manifesto. You know, when I see, okay, these small things that are happening to me are actually, symptomatic of this larger of larger problems um, and then that's that's where we start to move into the argument about why think how things got to where they are and how they can be fixed uh, Brad mentioned in his introduction uh, two of your many works of scholarship uh, the bloodlands and black earth both of which are about atrocities in history uh, and I was very taken with a passage in our malady in which that part of your life, and work is is mentioned that you write that much of my 30s and 40s I spent reading first person accounts of the Holocaust and other German crimes, Stalinist mass shootings and famine, ethnic cleansings and other atrocities. And, and you also uh, observe that at the worst moments of your illness, uh, your whole life did not rush before your eyes. Rather, you say it was my ability to suppress memories about what befell me, uh, memories of adulthood, uh, and more about what I learned from others. Uh, this put, you, you allow us to envision a kind of hospital bed visitations by the eyewitnesses to these uh, crimes against humanity that you witnessed. Is it accurate to conclude that the testimonies that you studied as a scholar were literally on your mind while you struggled through your illness and when you were writing Our Malady? You put it, you put it well, Jonathan. I mean, they were on my mind because I couldn't control what I was thinking. I mean, that's that, I mean, there, there are several pages in the book where I try to describe what it was like to be near death. 
And your question is about one, one thing, which is I, I remembered in the sense that I couldn't filter. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I realize I realized then, and it's very clear to me now that so much of what, so much of our consciousness is filtering the memory, right? That's, that's, that's what we, that's what our minds do much of the time. And what I experienced was an inability to filter. It was like, it, it just rushed over me and I didn't have the chance or the choice or the power to, to, to filter any of it. And that, and it, so it, it, be, it did begin with things that happened to me, which I don't talk about in the book, but then it proceeded in my adult life. It proceeded, as you said, to uh, the passages in prose in, in, in Holocaust testimonies, but also in, in other accounts of atrocity, which some, which had resonated with me at certain times. And, and, you know, it's, it's interesting how what we learn of things is what we, you know, what we learn of a testimony is what the testimony says, but it's also the moment in one's life when one reads it, right? It's encoded in a certain time and place and has a certain special meaning. So the, the, the ones which caught me the most intellectually had also clearly caught me the most in some sense emotionally because they, they some of the ones I think are most important and that I write about also, also came back. And then there was, you know, there was, my 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 doctoral supervisor had died not so long before that and he was a he was himself a survivor and he had a photo of his mother who was the person who was responsible for his surviving warsaw he had a photo of her on his bookshelf for the 25 or more years that i was visiting him and i always loved that photo because she was so self-possessed and i noticed how self-possessed she was a couple of decades before I actually figured out what she had done, which was to very, very calmly um, make sure that her two sons did not go to the Warsaw ghetto when they were summoned and required to do so. And so that that image of that of that woman, her name was Vanda Yelitska, that that image was one of the things that came back to me. But it was it was also this sense. I mean, it wasn't all dark. You know, it, it I means strangely it wasn't all dark because I was, you know, I was the idea. It wasn't an idea, but the feeling was. I I've learned from people, right? And in that sense, you know, I've learned from I've learned from people who are now dead, or people who are now dead have even have taught me, and I wouldn't be this person who I am now. So, it wasn't there was it wasn't like a happy it wasn't a happy feeling. But it wasn't it wasn't all dark either. It was the sense that like that life, you know, life moves through people, right? Life isn't just you. Life life moves through people, and and of course all this was happening to me when I was physically immobilized. So the only thing the only thing which was going on are these images going through my mind. Uh, I've been very helpfully prompted. I'm not sure by whom, uh, by someone who has pointed out that those of of our listeners. Who have not actually read your book are wondering what was your illness and i think it would be useful <laughs> if you could summarize what you were struggling with uh and and satisfy the curiosity of those who haven't read the book yet yeah no that's 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 maybe where we where we should have started so um i i i had appendicitis in it was the diagnosis was missed um, and then my, my appendix burst and I, I ignored it um, and I got peritonitis and I, I flew over the Atlantic Ocean with peritonitis, which is not something that anyone should do. Um, I finally got the right diagnosis for my appendicitis several days after my appendix had burst in the U.S. But then in the hospital in the U.S. where my appendix was removed, um, they forgot to tell me that they had noticed a liver infection as well. The liver infection was neglected, so the liver infection grew. I didn't know this at the time. Liver infection grew, um, spread into my blood. So what the, on December 29th, when, when the story of the book begins, the, the condition that I'm in is sepsis. So when I'm, when I'm lying in the hospital bed on the night of the 29th and having these feelings of rage and, and having, these, having these recollections that we're discussing, the condition that I'm in is sepsis. I have, a, I have an infection the size of a, of a baseball, a little bit bigger in my liver and my blood is full of infection um, and I'm on the way down. Uh, 
You point out, among other ironies, uh, that using your words, America helped to establish healthcare as a human right around the world. And yet you ask, why is it then that healthcare is not seen as such in the United States? Should we accept that citizens of other democracies enjoy a right that we are denied and live longer and healthier lives than we do? Uh, yet it's also true as I was, as long as I've been alive, and especially when I was growing up in the 50s, socialized medicine was the great boogeyman of American politics. Uh, do you see a turning point in American attitudes towards healthcare away from what you call commercial medicine? I think we, I think we have a shot, you know, and that, that shot depends upon rethinking some of the familiar history beyond America and in America. So uh, thinking about the subjects that I write about, like the Soviet Union is thought to be an argument against healthcare. I don't think that's true at all. Um, if we look at the thing that we that we that we oppose the most in the Soviet Union, which is the gulag, the gulag was a was a situation of competitive healthcare where the if you were relatively strong, you got some medical attention, and if you were very weak, you did not get medical attention, which is unfortunately an extreme version of a problem that we have in the United States. If you look at Nazi Germany, which you know, presumably we all think is a negative example still. Um, in Nazi Germany, healthcare was understood as racial. So some peoples were regarded as bearers of disease and other peoples were regarded as inherently healthy, uh, which would suggest that the opposite of that would be regarding every human being as deserving of equal treatment. So our own historical negative examples, I think actually point us in a different direction. They should point us towards universal healthcare. And then grappling with our own history um, is very important here. I mean, I, I think the problem is not that we think too much about freedom. I think our problem is that we have too thin and too inhuman an idea of freedom in this country. That the idea that freedom is something that the market brings you and that freedom just means, you know, expressing the emotions that you happen to feel at that moment. That's a very small, a very thin notion of freedom. Freedom has to include the body. And if it does, you know, that's, I mean, that's something that being very sick teaches you in a way that you're not going to forget. If you physically can't talk, you don't have freedom of speech. If you physically can't move, you don't have freedom of, of assembly um, and so on and so forth. I mean, Jefferson, when he was talking about the pursuit of happiness, he was actually talking about the physical pursuit of happiness. And Jefferson thought that, you know, without, without, he said as much, without health, freedom is, is meaningless. So I, I think we have to rethink our own idea of freedom and understand that it has to include our body, which means everybody's body, which means black bodies, which means immigrant bodies, because the only way that you can get to freedom as a right, and this is where we get caught, is by thinking of it as everybody's right. And the only way we can get to there is by grappling with, with our own history. Uh, you write about your experiences in literally in the hospital in um, Vienna, uh, when your child, one of your children was born, and of course you had experience in two countries in your recent illness. Is there a country whose health program you regard as the model we should aspire toward? So it's, I, I, I wanna, I, I write about other countries in this book because I wanted to be clear to Americans, you know, I'm sure it's clear to a lot of folks who are listening to us now, but. I wanted to be clear to Americans that there is another way. I mean, part of the problem with the American discussion is that we assume that in this field and in so many others, that the, the way we do it is the way to do it. And maybe we can tinker a little bit, but basically we assume that there isn't really another way. And of course, there is another way. Um, the, starting from the premise that healthcare is a right rather than that healthcare is a business is normal in most of the developed world. And by the way, in most of the developed world, people live longer, healthier lives than Americans. And in that respect are also freer. Um, if you have less fear and anxiety, if you think you're gonna live longer, you are in powerful senses of the word freer. So I write about Austria and Germany and France and England in the book, partly just to conjure up that, you know, that sense that in other countries, people really do it in different ways. And as a matter of fact, it works better. And you know, to press home a point, um, it's also just a lot less expensive than in this country. I don't, you know, I, I write about Austria, not because I want to go to the mat and say that Austria is perfect. 
Um, it isn't. I mean, I've had some disappoint, disappointing experiences here too, but because I've lived here the longest and I've had the most meaningful experiences here, I've been to the hospital several times here as well. But more than that, one of my, my, my son, as you say, was born here. And that, that point at the beginning of life um, is, is just as revealing as the end of life. And I give and a whole chapter of the book, by the way, is about the beginning of life. Um, our malady is all like on tyranny is divided up into lessons. There are only four and not, and not 20. But one of them is actually about the beginning of life and about childhood and about how important childhood is for freedom. And you see the difference there very sharply, Jonathan. I mean, in, in the US, if you're a pregnant woman, they try to they, they, they don't let you into the hospital until the last moment and they want you out as quickly as possible. And that is simply about money. There is no other explanation. You need no other explanation. That is just about money. Whereas, and that means that American women die. I mean, if you're an American, if you're an African American woman, there are 70 countries you can go to where you're less likely to die in childbirth. But if you're just an American woman abstracting from race, there are still more than 40 countries, 40, where you can go and be less likely to die in childbirth than, than the US. Whereas in, in, in Austria, because it's not about money, you, um, as soon as you start having contractions, you, I, I mean, it's strange for me to use you, like here we are two guys talking, yeah. <laughs> right? But as soon as, as soon as, as soon as a woman starts having contractions, they want you to come into the hospital. They don't kick you out, mm -hmm. they want you there. And then when you give birth, you're, you, you have to stay for four days afterwards. So you learn how to nurse the child, you learn how to bathe the child. And this is part of a, of an engagement, you know, with the child, which is going to last for the for the first few years of, of the child's life. And that is possible, right? I mean, that like that's that 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 makes life very different. And I wanted people to have a sense, not that European countries are perfect, they're not, but that people can really live in different ways and feel freer. Like when I was in a birthing class, I realized the guys I'm talking to are talking about. Um, in Vienna, I mean, they're talking about two years of parental leave and how they're going to split up two years of parental leave with with their partner. I mean, apart from anything else, that's that's a lot of freedom which they're going to have in their young lives, which which Americans just don't have and can't even imagine. Right? I'm trying to make that kind of thing imaginable. Uh, your book is not about the pandemic, uh, but you all you do write that no democracy mishandled the coronavirus pandemic as we have done. Uh, but you also point out that Americans suffer and die for lots of reasons. Your list includes pollution deaths, opioid deaths, prison deaths, suicides, newborn deaths, and, and more recently, mass graves for the elderly, all too familiar. Uh, yet none of these uh, other causes of death uh, have yet prompted any effective change in American medicine. Do you think the pandemic is the tipping point on that issue? Let me put it this way. I think the country is at a tipping point in general. So, you know, it's gonna become clear, we're talking now in early September, 2020, it's gonna become clear in the next four months or so, whether we are going to tip one way or whether we're going to tip another way. So we can tip into some kind of lazily fascist oligarchical regime, or we can tip into a reaffirmation of democracy, which will be looking, despite itself, I would even say, for radical means of change. I think if there was a Biden presidency, it can't be about returning to 2016. A Biden presidency um, is going to have to be about leaping towards some kind of better America, which means that healthcare is a place that will have to start. So I don't think that I don't think the pandemic alone is enough, but I do think the broader state of our politics is such that we will have to we we're going to be we're going to be we're going to be moving radically one way or another. I think in four or five months, and healthcare would be a good place to start. Uh, you know, the thought occurs to me, although we're talking about uh, our malady, I'm sure everybody is interested in your thoughts about the upcoming election, especially in the long shadow of on tyranny, which was provoked by the first uh, uh, election that uh, Trump won. Are you optimistic, pessimistic, guarded about what's going to happen in this country? 
I mean, I have basically the same historian's perspective that I had four years ago, namely that the spectrum of possibilities is usually wider than we think. I mean, one thing you notice as a historian is that the things that actually happen are often just outside the bandwidth of what people are talking about and predicting at the time right before those things happen for, for ill, but also sometimes for good. So I didn't have any trouble imagining in 2016 that we would be where we are now, right? I mean, I did imagine that we would have a president who would ignore term limits and promise to fake elections and bow down to foreign dictators. I said as much at the time, and now that's all happening. Um, so uh, where I think we are is that we're at a place where I think the verb election is no longer, or the noun election, the verb elect isn't necessarily fully describing the picture. I think Mr. Trump, who has considerable political intelligence of a certain kind, is perfectly aware that he's not going to win an election. He's not, I, I don't think he's actually trying to be elected in the sense of winning the popular or even the electoral college vote. I think what he's trying to do is create the background conditions for a spoiled election, a kind of rolling coup d'etat, in which he will somehow be able to find a way to stay in power. That's where I think we are, which means that the Democrats have to win both an election and they have to win a protest movement and they have to win a kind of moral victory. They have to have a clear account of what they're doing, which goes beyond the fact that they're probably gonna count a lot more votes. So, I mean, I think, you know, just to be very clear, I think we're in a slow motion Reichs Reichstag fire type situation where Mr. Trump is trying to provoke crisis after crisis in the hope that somehow the combination of crises is gonna allow him to get through what he knows is going to be an electoral debacle for him in, in November. But the advantage we have um, is that we know this. We, we know that how emergency politics works. Um, and, and in 2020, Americans are much more aware of the dark political possibilities than they were in 2016. So I'm not going to say I'm optimistic, but I'll repeat what I said before, which is that we're at a tipping point. It, 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 this can go very dark, but I think it, it also could turn out much better than people think it could probably turn out. Um, the thought occurred to me throughout the, the book, uh, what, to, to measure what you were aspiring to against the possibilities that have been discussed in terms of, of public health and, and American medicine. Uh, and I want to ask two questions. Do you think that the Affordable Care Act is a model that we should be fighting for? Do you think the so-called Medicare for all is the model we should be fighting for? I, I go back, Jonathan, to the to the, the question you hinted you were going to ask at the very beginning. Um, about you know the the fundamental issues, I, I think that before I before I get to Affordable Care Act and Medicare for All, I think the important thing is how we think about all of this, because if we just think about health as like one more issue that's controversial and that's been politically difficult in the past, we're gonna get nowhere. We have to think about this in a different way. We have to think: look, freedom includes our bodies, or it's nothing at all. So if we, if we care about freedom, whether we're right, left, or center, if we care about freedom, we have to also be talking about our bodies. Because if our bodies are not free, if we're dying en masse, if we're afraid all the time, which Americans are, then we're not free. And you know, a, a, a thought which is related to that, we have to get out of, an, of our economy of pain. We're, if we're gonna have you know, freedom, you know, to quote Jefferson again, if freedom means the pursuit of happiness, we have to get out of a situation which is about pain, where you know, the way our medical system works is that some people have less bad insurance than others. And the people who have less bad insurance take secret pleasure in the fact that they're getting covered while other people are not getting covered. That's sadism. We're all taking, those of us who are relatively better off are taking pleasure in the pain of other people. We wouldn't admit it, of course, but that's the way the whole system works. And that's a trap. We're all trapped by that. Of course, the people who are worse off are trapped by that. But even the people who are less bad off are trapped by that because we think, okay, look, I'm getting better treatment than them. And we confuse our less bad treatment with good treatment. Whereas the fundamental truth is that, you know, the, the people working at the grocery store around the corner in Vienna have better medical care than almost anybody in the United States. 
right now. And they're, and they're not paying money for it. They're paying almost nothing for it. And yet they have, they have better medical care than almost anybody in the US. We've been scammed. This is a numbers racket. We have been scammed. Um, we have a wealth transfer system, which is masquerading as a healthcare system. So we need to get mentally, we have to get out of this and think, okay, not an economy of pain, but the pursuit of happiness. Um, we have to have a right to health. We, our bodies have to be in this conversation. We have to have a right to health. And if once, and if, and if we agree with those premises, you know, then the answer to your question is pretty obvious. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you know, I think the Affordable Care Act is much better than no Affordable Care Act, but. I think what we need to be doing is building a situation of universal health care, um, a single payer system where Americans can exhale and say, OK, I have decent coverage. My neighbor has decent coverage. Everybody has decent coverage. And now we can move on to something else. We can live calmer lives, longer, calmer, freer lives. Um, the Affordable Care Act, such as it is, is about as far from socialized medicine as we can get. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, it was a Republican invention and I, and I have the impression that Obama chose it because he thought Republicans might actually get on board with it since Romney had introduced it in Massachusetts. And yet it's the Republicans who tried to abort the ACA in Congress and they have never stopped trying to kill it in the courts, not even now. And so my, my question too is if even the preservation of the ACA is at risk, how do we make the great leap from commercial medicine to uh, uh, medical coverage for all? I, I think, you know, one, the political ironies are of course endless. I mean, it's not just that Mitt Romney proposed something like the Affordable Care Act. I mean, Richard Nixon proposed, proposed universal health care. So, you know, you can, you can dig deep into American history and you can find Republicans supporting this, Republicans supporting that. It doesn't really matter because right now, you know, as your question suggests, Republicans are going to oppose anything which makes people less anxious and less fearful. When, when your whole platform is making most of your constituents live more anxious lives, of course you're gonna oppose healthcare, which they do. I mean, if, if what you run on is fear, you're not gonna support policies that make give people less fearful lives. So it has to be, to use your word, it has to be a leap. You have to say, no, we're not gonna to try to cobble together some kind of coalition, that's not, going to work, right? That's that even if it works, it's not going to work, which is what we've, we're seeing now. What you have to be able to say is, imagine an America where we were all freer, where we were all living longer lives, where, you know, we all had four or five more years to spend with our grandchildren. You know, we have to be able to make big arguments like that and then go for it, right? I mean, this has to be a New Deal type paradigm. It has to be the notion that we're, we're doing something big. We're not just looking to cobble something together. We're going to actually do something for America. I mean, there's this, there's this idea, you know, when the pandemic started, we haven't even talked about the pandemic, but when the pandemic started, you know, this cliche started popping up in American media. Oh, we have the best medical system in the world. No, we don't. I mean, it's not even vaguely close. We don't even remotely have the best medical system in the world. Um, it's, 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 it's laughable. We have some of the best technologies. And if, you have, if, you have, if, you're, if you're wealthy, you can get access to extremely good care, but the medical system is not even close. It's not even like, it's not even first class. Um, uh, what we have to be able to do is really say, we would like to have an America, which has the best medical system. We can make Americans live longer than other people. We could reduce child death and childbirth to almost nothing. We could do these things, but it has to be like that. It has to be an Apollo mission. It has to be a vision of a vision of greatness, I think is what it has to be. Uh, you mentioned in your book, and you've just mentioned in our conversation uh, that uh, commercial medicine is a numbers racket and it benefits uh, private insurance, private hospitals, I presume big pharma as well. Uh, but you also write in your book, a very provocative line. Uh, we have commercial medicine from cradle to grave because that is what we have chosen. Uh, uh, in what sense have we made that choice? Uh, is this not a system that's been imposed on us? I think, yeah, I think that's a very, I think that's a fair point um, because the, the, Amer the American medical system as we have it feels like the weather. It doesn't feel like something we could change. And the very fact that it sucks up so much of the gross domestic product 
makes people think that it's normal, right? I mean, more than, but actually more than 20% of the economy in healthcare is not healthy. That's not normal. That's, that's a ton of profit taking. Um, it's it, it, the money that insurance companies take from us it doesn't really achieve anything. And so therefore it actually, it's basically holds us back from being healthy. And so that's counted in GDP, but that means that um, as your question suggests, there are very powerful interests who are opposed to changing this system. So you're right, it's not something that any one person has chosen, but I do think we are going along, um, we are going along with a pathetically inadequate understanding of freedom. and insofar as we define ourselves as a country where liberty matters and where freedom matters, if we use these words in a way which excludes things like health, then we are going along, then we're choosing this, right? I mean, this is the kind of argument that the East European dissidents used to make in much tougher conditions, that if you choose to accept the language of the system, then in some sense, you're choosing to accept the system. If we choose to exclude our bodies from our discussion of freedom, then we are choosing to accept the system as it is. So in, in, that, in that sense, I would say we're, we're, we're choosing this. And you know, what we need is a, we need a leap of imagination, which can come from examples from other countries, but it can also come from imagining the opposite of what we've got. You know, before 2020, we were dying from opioid addiction, from pollution, from too many things that people in advanced countries should not be dying from. And 2020 itself has shown us, you know, basically we've had a kind of pre-medieval response to a pandemic. And we, if we think about this and think, okay, what would the opposite of this be? What would it be like if we weren't all quarantined and fearful? What would that be like? What would the opposite of this be like? Because that opposite is actually attainable. You know, that, 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 can be, that can be reached. Uh, I'm going to ask two questions. I hope they will be brief, and I then will go to the questions uh, that have been posed by the audience and, and read them aloud. Um, our malady is not a sequel, but it's certainly a sibling to On Tyranny, uh, your book about the danger that the current occupant of the White House poses to American democracy. Uh, On Tyranny was quite specific. It was really prescriptive about what individuals could do to face this danger. Uh, what do you see as the specific things that readers of all, our malady can do to move in the direction uh, of a health program for everyone? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question because it sorts out the difference between the two books. In, on, in on Tyranny, what I'm saying is, look, we all basically understand what the constitution is, how the Republic's supposed to work. Let me now dig into history and bring out some examples of people who were in much more demanding situations and let's all profit from their experience. And so I'm writing about Jews in the 30s. I'm writing about intellectuals in the 50s. I'm writing about anti-communist dissidents in the 70s. And I'm trying to say, look, there's a whole, there's a whole panoply of possible reactions to oppression that we can draw from. Now, there's this whole history which we've forgotten about because we thought we were a chosen democracy or history ended, let's draw from that. In, in our malady, I'm doing something different. In our malady, I'm, what I'm saying is, it's not about defense. I mean, I, I still stand by everything that's in on tyranny, by the way, every, every word, but in, in our malady is not about a defense. Our malady is about thinking about a future where we have a broader understanding of freedom. And so, you know, the lessons in, in, in our malady are necessarily more about a community. You know, the, the lessons are, think of healthcare as a human right, um, uh, know that freedom begins with children, um, uh, the truth will set you free, and put doctors in charge. Now, there are things that individuals can do with respect to those things, but these actually require policy. They, they require um, localities, states, and the federal government to do things. So I guess the, 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 what I'm asking individuals to do in this book is to think through the kinds of things we've been talking about, about how our notion of freedom can be broader um, and how we actually at some level know, because my experience is just one, right? I mean, there are, we, all, we actually all know from our own experiences that something is deeply wrong with this system. And if we can clarify that and turn it into a positive agenda um, by, you know, especially by 2021, then we have a chance to really to really turn things around. But you're, I, I appreciate the question, Jonathan, because in that it highlights a difference between the two books. There are there are limits to what you can do by yourself. Uh, here's my final question before we go to the audience. Um, 
the, the account of your illness is harrowing, uh, but also fascinating. You, you write that you, your ability to speak English was impaired, but not your ability to speak Polish, that you lost your ability to tie a tie. Uh, you write, recovery is not going back to the way things were. I am not exactly as I was. Uh, you seem great today, uh, and I and I wonder how are how far along have you come to the person you were before your illness? I'm so I mean, I'm in, I'm, I'm interested in having the relationships with other people that I had at that time. I'm not necessarily interested in being exactly the same person. You know, I, I think we we have. I mean, we have to learn from experiences like this. And I've tried, I've tried to learn from it. And the book is what I think I did learn as, as usefully described as I can as I can make it. But also it's 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 totally clear that my that you know whatever it whatever ails me, and some of it was some of it's unclear. I mean, we described the basics, but I also, I mean, I had I had some pretty I had some pretty disheartening neurological symptoms um, which continue. And I and I, I mean, and, and clearly because of the infection or because of something else, um, there were th th some things clearly happened, you know, to me mentally. Um, and I'm interested in that because I don't think it's necessarily negative, right? I mean, it's not, it's not just that I had these extreme experiences and they're extreme. It's also that I went through something, I came out the other side and some things had to be built back like my ability, my ability to, to sustain conversations and um, my ability to write English prose. I mean, I wrote this book for a lot of reasons, but one of them was to prove to myself that I could, I could still do it, that I was still me in that sense. And I am still me, but I think my prose style is a little bit different and that's all right. Why does it have to be exactly the same as it was before? And this is what I mean by recovery. I mean, I'm thinking about America too. I don't want to be exactly the person I was in 2019 because the person I was almost died. You know, I don't want to be that person again. I want to be a slightly different person who avoids those things and who has learned has learned something that can be passed on. And you know, it, by a very rough analogy, I want the same thing for my country. I don't want my country to go back to 2016. Obviously, in 2016, there were some things that were wrong which we weren't paying attention to, and that got us to the situation where our democracy is almost dying. So what, what can we learn so that we, not so that we can go back because we can't go back, but what do we learn so that we can be better? We can be more interesting. And the very fact that we're damaged, of course we're damaged, but the damage can, be, the damage can lead to creativity. The damage can lead to, to, to new solutions that we wouldn't otherwise have seen. So there we are. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna pass along a question from Wallace McDonald. Uh, he, he writes, uh, you wrote a remarkable book a few years ago uh, on your conversation, conversations with Tony Jude as he was dying in an effort to capture his thoughts, reflections, and experiences. Uh, this was also a very introspective book, although you were looking in a deeply intuitive way at the thinking of another scholar. Did this experience influence you as you were writing Our Malady? It's... it's I mean, I think autobiography is really hard. I think it's really hard to know what is actually influencing oneself. I can say for sure that Tony Jutt has been very much on my mind. I mean, for those of you who haven't read Tony Jutt, he was not only a superb historian, but he was also um, a, a, an unparalleled commentator um, on European and then, and then in the last stage of his life on American politics. And he had, you know, he had these dual virtues of an intellectual, which is that he wrote extremely well, but and he was also unafraid to write extremely clearly. So when Tony, when Tony was dying of ALS, I, I helped him to work by proposing that we have conversations, which we did, and we finished the book together, which was called Thinking the Twentieth Century, um, a, a few days before before Tony died. He's been on my mind because I miss him. And I think the country misses him. I think there are too few people of that kind of stature and that kind of courage around in 20, you know, 2016 to 2020 when we when we really needed when we really needed him, needed people like that. I, I be, beyond that, it's it's really hard to say. I mean, what Tony faced was so much worse than what I faced. I didn't know what was coming. It hit me really quickly. I was 
I was confused by it. I fought it. I fought it with everything that I had and, you know, knock on appropriate surface, um, uh, you know, kind of inshallah, like I'm okay. Uh, but what Tony knew was that he was going, Tony knew that he was going to die and he knew that he was going to lose his physical faculties as he was dying. That's a, that's an incomparably worse condition than, than, than I was in. I think, you know, Tony's a model of clarity. He's also a model of just sort of basic physical courage. Um, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if I can say that I emulated that, but it's certainly something which is worth emulating. Um, we've uh, gotten several questions, uh, which I'm going to summarize in, uh, in the form of one question asked by Erzabeth Beckus. Uh, how far do you think the fact that there is no universal medical care in the U.S. is a race-related issue? So let me, let me expand it. So let's talk, about, let's talk about the whole clump of political evil around this. It's not just that we don't have universal health care. We also don't have we don't have sick leave. Um, uh, we, we don't really have vacation. Um, we, 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 we don't have child care. Um, we don't have parental leave. We don't have all these things which you know Americans regard them as benefits as somehow marginal, but we don't have all these things which allow other people in comparable countries to build up a life. Um, I mean sick leave plus parental leave plus vacation starts to create a life where you have your interests and you can sustain them and you have time to pass them on to your children, right? A, a life of freedom because you have you just have more time and more avenues and 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 more ability to build up your own way of, 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 of passing through the decades with your with yourself or with your friends or with your family. So I just I, I agree with the premise of the question. I just want to expand it and say we're denying ourselves not just universal health care, but freedom in a much broader sense because of race. And it, it, the, the way that it works is I'm pretty familiar and other people have written about this better than me, although it does feature, feature it does figure in my book. An, an, an economy of happiness, of the pursuit of happiness would say, we all have the right to something. What happens in America is that what, what should be a right gets defined as a, a privilege. And then the next move is to say, well, those people will abuse the privilege those blacks, they'll abuse the privilege. Um, those immigrants, they'll abuse the privilege. And then the, the next move is to say, but you white people, you tough, sturdy white people, you rugged individualists, you don't even need this stuff. You're too tough for this. You're never gonna need this. And so those two moves, right? The, 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 the abuse of the, the other and the kind of soulless flattery of the self get us into this position where we're in this economy of pain, where white people are relatively pleased because they think they're doing better than black people. Whereas the truth is that everyone should be doing much better. But the trick is if in order for white people to do much better, black people also have to do much better. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the history of race is essentially the history of how we're denying ourselves this broad concept of freedom. Uh, we have a question from Michelle Arsenault. Uh, can you talk more about the missed diagnosis that started your medical ordeal and why you think it was missed? And as the lawyer in the room, I'd like to add to that. Uh, how do you feel about the doctor who made the misdiagnosis or failed to make the correct diagnosis? So um, we, we, um, we have a relatively short period of time and I'm happy that we've devoted our relatively short period of time to these important issues of policy and, and freedom because I could very easily have taken up all of our time by talking about the medical mistakes because it wasn't, it wasn't just one. Um, I mean, I, I, before I wrote our malady, I wrote this much longer document um, about hundred pages long based on my medical record for my own satisfaction chiefly where I was trying to pin down all the mistakes that people made all the times when you know, not because I, I will answer the direct question, but that wasn't the only thing which went wrong. Um, the misdiagnosis was uh, was in Germany, and in, in the, the Germans and the Austrians have a certain tendency to think that everything is viral because they don't like to prescribe antibiotics. And I've seen that happen more than once. And you know, in my case, I had appendicitis. How do I know I have appendicitis? Because 36 hours, my appendix burst. 
um, that's kind of a sign, right? That you have appendicitis is when your appendix bursts, but it was missed. I'm confident that that was missed. I think that was, I, I, that was obviously a big deal. And in the book, I try to make it clear that not only American doctors miss, mess things up, but after that, um, the, the American doctors overlook the second infection. And then in the emergency room, all kinds of crazy things happened, um, uh, which included American doctors being unwilling to believe that doctors in their own hospital had made a mistake and therefore running me through all kinds of tests which weren't really necessary and avoiding the obvious thing, which was that I had an infection which had to do with an operation which had just happened not very long ago. Um, so how do I feel? I mean, here's how I feel paradoxically. Here's how I feel. I feel like, I, I, I look, I, I mean, personally, I don't wanna be inside a hospital again anytime soon, but uh, I feel like our nurses and our doctors are much better than our system. The, the, the fourth lesson of the book is actually put the doctors in charge. I think part of this commercial medicine is that the doctors are becoming walking advertisements for private equity firms or whoever owns your hospital, which if you don't know, look it up. Um, the doctors are becoming basically cutouts. They're becoming, you know, they're becoming literally sometimes they're just cut, you walk into the hospital and there's a cutout figure of your doctor or there's a picture of your doctor on a billboard on the highway. That's a bad sign, right? When a person is being turned into an advertisement, that's a bad sign. When that flesh and blood person who's supposed to be tending to your care becomes this smiling pixelated face, which is supposed to draw you into their hospital, something is definitely wrong at that point. And something is wrong. And the thing that's wrong is that our doctors are fundamentally disempowered. Um, they can't talk about what's going on because their contracts have gag rules. Um, they spend all their time on record keeping and the record keeping is all about profit. It's not about care, which among other things was a terrible thing to have during the, during the pandemic. Um, and above all, their time is squeezed by their bosses so that they, they can't really follow cases and they can't, they can't build up human stories the way that they really have to do. So, I mean, I got kicked around pretty well by a whole series of doctors and some, some of the details are in the book, but I nevertheless think that the way to get out of this is to let the doctors be doctors again. Slowly and surely, doctors have ceased being what we think doctors are. And I think if Americans actually could somehow look at a doctor and see how weak the position of the doctor actually now is, we'd be terrified because the whole system, the whole profit-making system assumes that we trust the doctor. The doctor is like the thing which, the thing which draws us in, but the doctor is shockingly powerless inside the system. And that's unfortunately fatal for the rest of us. I wanna pass along a comment and then a question. Anna Goldman has no question, but she's expressing her gratitude to the medical staff that did pull you through this. So that's looking on the bright side. Uh, Harvey Nabilski uh, says that he's responsible for uh, quality assurance in a major hospital. And if these problems had arisen in his system, he says, he would have valued or they would have valued a conversation with you about your experience. And he asks if you've been in conversation with the medical staff about these errors and omissions and how did they respond if you have? So, I mean, as to the comment about, I mean, I, I don't want to sound, the medical staff who saved me, I, that's, I just, I, that's just unfortunately not how it was. I mean, we would like for it to be a nice story where like, I, you know, I, I, I fell in this mysterious illness and then some brilliant doctor, but unfortunately, unfortunately, that's just not how it happened. Um, I, I wish I could say it was, but, but, it, but it wasn't. I was exposed to a whole series of dangers that I just shouldn't have been exposed to, most of which were, were man-made. There were some doctors who huddled around and, and helped me, especially towards, towards the end. And I'm, I'm grateful to all of them. I'm, I'm grateful to, the, to, to doctors and nurses who work within this system. But I think the thing I really want to avoid, and I want all of us to avoid, is the hero narrative because I think the hero narrative kills us. What the hero, because as soon as we start talking about heroes, which we've been doing too much of in the pandemic, what we're admitting is the entire situation is totally messed up because you only need heroes when the whole system is messed up. So as soon as you find yourself, not that, I mean, the, I'm sorry, the comment was very kind and, and well meant, and I'm, I'm kind of using it as a platform to make a, a, a related point, but 
as soon as we personalize it and talk about the doctors as heroes, what we're acknowledging is that the system is a disaster. I don't want my doctor to be a hero. I want my doctor to do her job in a system which allows her to do her job. And I think if our system were better than the doctors who, I mean, I, the things that I went through, most of which we haven't talked about, you know, happily, had to do with the structure the doctors were working in. It had to do with their lack of time, with their distraction, with their with the with the terrible record keeping. I want them to be free of all of that, so that the, so that they can do the job that they're supposed to do, so they can do the job that they went to medical school for. The answer to the second question is yes. Um, I've had I had a long conversation with um, with the physician who was most personally responsible for what what happened to me. And I've been in contact with a number, I've had conversations with a number of the people who were responsible or in some way related to my care. So it's not that I've, I mean, I've, I was quite forthright with them in the immediate aftermath of what happened. Um, and, you know, I, I'm happy to continue to talk to them. Um, but for me, I guess this is not just about that. I mean, I want all of them, I want, the, I mean, I want the people who, I, who didn't do their job as I would like to have seen them do their job, I want them to work in better conditions. I mean, the, I, want, I want the doctors to work in better conditions. I'm not angry at the doctors. I mean, I'm angry at the system. There was a time, I mean, of course, there was a time when I was angry at everything, um, but now I'm angry at the system. I'm not, I'm not angry at any individuals anymore. Uh, I'm gonna ask a, a final question as a point of personal privilege. It's only slightly off topic. And then uh, when you're done answering, I'll invite Bradley Graham to, to resume the microphone. Uh, you write in passing uh, that American public health does worse than Belarus, which you describe as the most Soviet of the post-Soviet states. Uh, since my own grandfather was born in Voivrusk, in what is now Belarus, I am moved to ask what you make of the current political crisis in Belarus and specifically do you think that Belarus will share the fate of Ukraine and Crimea at the hands of Putin? So I mean, just to take a step back, maybe for those who haven't been following this so closely, um, you know, Jonathan's kindly asking about Eastern Europe because I'm an, I'm an East Europeanist. And, um, and, and what's happened in Belarus is that Alexander Lukashenko, who has been in power for, uh, for a quarter century, has, has faked yet another election, but this time, the, the faking didn't go unnoticed. And this time there's a, a predominance of opinion that understands that he faked the election that in fact, most of society is against him. And amazingly in Belarus, which is a country where, you know, repression is not an abstraction, but repression is a daily lived experience where people are still being tortured and still being beaten as we're having this conversation. Amazingly in that country, the barrier of fear has been broken. And you can see and feel and hear how the barrier of fear has 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 been has been broken. Um, I'm it, it, so, uh, and, and the, for me, the, the the incredibly interesting thing about Belarus right now, beginning to answer your question, is that it's not it's not about East and West. It's not about the European Union or NATO or Russia. It's almost it kind of has a kind of textbook purity about it because it's just about democracy. It's just about democracy. The, the demand is let's have clean elections. So even the personalities aren't important because what the personalities, the personalities are often you know, the colleague or the wife of someone who's been put in prison. And the, the platform is let's have a free election. And that's it, let's see what happens. And I find that incredibly heartening because you know, our democracy is not just threatened, it's, it's flawed and we can get cynical about it. And I find it very heartening to see people who are willing to take risks for a democracy as such. What's gonna happen next? I, I, you know, I, I, I don't know, um, I don't know. But I, I think in the long run, um, the, 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 the dictator in Belarus is lost. The question is what form the loss is going to take. Um, in a world where the United States, you know, at the moment anyway, where the United States is not interested in democracy, but is interested in dictatorship, at least at the very top, and in a world where the European Union is hesitant to get involved in these issues for various ways, I think Russia will, will creep back, not just kind of in the absence of anyone else. Uh, but I think that, I think in a deeper level, what's happening in Belarus 
is a positive example from Eastern Europe. And it's a sign of things that are probably to come in Russia as, as, as well. So that's, that's where I'll leave it. Thank you, Tim. Well, thanks, Jonathan, for so ably guiding the conversation. And, and Tim, I'm sure that the audience uh, joins me in expressing relief and gladness that you survived your harrowing experience with the American medical system and, and can now add your, your own insightful voice to the call for major sy systemic reform. Uh, again, the title of Tim's book is Our Malady. Uh, and you uh, watching out there can, can get a copy uh, or several by clicking on the link that we've posted in the chat column. Uh, to everyone watching, uh, thanks again for tuning in. And from all of us here at Politics and Prose, stay well and well read. Thanks, Brad.